Today's speaker, uh, Dr. Nancy Chen, who is a postdoc uh, in Graham Coop's lab uh, at uh, UC Davis, uh, where she'll be for another year before starting a faculty position at the University of, of Rochester. And uh, Nancy did her undergraduate work uh, at Harvard uh, with Scott, and did some work with Scott Edwards, uh, and then did her PhD at uh, Cornell with John Fitzpatrick and Andy Clark where she worked on Florida scrub jays. So people probably know about this famous population of endangered Florida scrub jays that have been tracked for uh, many years, and there are, there are pedigrees for all of these birds. And she published, Nancy published a very nice paper in Current Biology, uh, I don't know, a year or two ago, two years ago, uh, showing uh, that uh, there was actually gene flow from peripheral populations that had an important effect on genetic variation. And so it was an unusual opportunity to study, the, take these populations that have been well pedigreed and apply uh, some genomic data. Uh, so uh, today she will be speaking uh, more about Florida scrub jays in a pedigreed wild population. Uh, so thank you for making the trip from Davis. You welcome to the OMBZ. Thank you. And um, thank you, Michael, for that nice introduction. I'm excited to talk to all of you guys today about some recent work um, Again, continuing on looking at genomics in the Florida scrub jay. So we're all used to thinking about evolution as a really slow process, right? A process that um, takes hundreds or if not thousands of years that isn't easily observed um, during our lifetimes. But a number of recent studies have demonstrated that actually we can see rapid evolutionary change over short time scales. And so classic examples of rapidly changing phenotypes over time include the uh, uh, evolution of melanism in peppered moths in the UK, as well as the evolution of beak size and shape in Darwin's fishes. We also know that you can get rapid phenotypic change due to human, uh, human influences. So for instance, there have been nice studies that have shown evolution of decreased um, body weight and horn size in bighorn sheep due to hunting pressures. Um, and fisheries have caused the evolution of reduced age at maturi maturity um, in the Atlantic cod. <coughs> and so while we know a lot about um, rapid phenotypic change, much less is known about rapid evolution at the genomic level. Um, in understanding how populations evolve, in contemporary timescales, it's really important if we're trying to understand how we can conserve species in the face of rapid environmental change, um, or think about how to feed the rapidly growing human environment. Problem is, is that studying contemporary evolution is actually very difficult, and the best opportunities for doing so come from a handful of long-term demographic studies in which people have accumulated um, complete life histories for thousands of individuals over decades. And so, for example, um, the classic study of great tits in Wythe and Woods has demonstrated that birds are beginning to breed three weeks in advance, um, largely due to climate change. The system has also led to a lot of interesting studies about how variation in social behavior can lead to differences in cultural evolution and disease spread. Um, a long-term study of red deer on the Isle of Rum <coughs> has showed that sexually antagonistic selection um, can help maintain levels of genetic variation in the population. Um, and this system has also been used for a lot of the foundational work <coughs> on estimating heritabilities and genetic correlations among traits in natural populations. A long-term study of soe sheep on the island of St. Kilda um, has showed that genetic differences among individuals can cause variation in their rates of aging, which is one of the first studies of senescence in the wild. Um, and studies of this population have also contributed a lot to our understanding of host parasite interactions um, and population dynamics. Um, and as Michael mentioned before, a long-term study of the Florida scrub jay at Archibald Biological Station in Florida um, has led to a lot of our understanding of the evolution of cooperative breeding behavior. So why, what are the proximate and ultimate causes of cooperative breeding and what are some of the underlying physiological mechanisms? And so while these studies um, give us the opportunity to, to address many fundamental questions in ecology and evolution that are otherwise inaccessible to most people, 
adding genomics allows us to open in a whole new layer of evolutionary questions. And so what my work does is I combine an evolutionary genetic approach with these long-term demographic studies. Um, and I do a lot of inference using the population pedigree. And my focus is on understanding basic questions in evolutionary biology, such as what is the genetic basis of fitness in the environment? And what are the uh, evolutionary processes that maintain variation in regions of the genome through time? Um, another major focus uh, is trying to understand the genetic consequences of population decline um, in natural populations. But for today, what I'm going to focus on is looking at short-term evolutionary dynamics uh, at the genomic level. So as I said before, there are many instances of rapid phenotypic change, but there are fewer studies looking at rapid change at the genomic level, mostly because um, temporal genomic data sets remain fairly rare. So the system I use is the Florida Scope Jay, this beautiful cooperative breeding bird. Um, it is federally threatened. Uh, these birds are non-migratory and highly philopatric, which is convenient because we can follow the same individuals throughout their lifetime. Um, they're socially and they're mostly genetically monogamous. There are really, really low rates of extra pair fraternity in these birds. Um, but we can construct fairly accurate pedigrees using field observations alone. These birds are also really nice to work with because they are addicted to peanuts and will do anything for peanuts, including landing on your hand, your head, or taking them from your mouth. Um, this is not standard field protocol. Most birds do not do this in the field. Um, these birds are restricted to this really unique fire-maintained scrub habitat that is now primarily found along the Lake Royals Ridge in central Florida. Um, this habitat is actually full of, of many other endemic species, um, and so the Florida scrub jay is kind of an umbrella species for conserving this highly endemic ecosystem. And because of this, this ecosystem is being rapidly destroyed due to uh, development, so mostly citrus groves, cattle ranching, um, and another issue is that even in mitigated land, um, there's a lot of fire suppression going on, which also affects um, dynamics in this ecosystem. So because of habitat loss and fire suppression, we've seen dramatic decreases in population size for these birds. So there's been a 97% decline in the past century and more than a 50% decline in just the past 20 years. Um, one of the nice things about this bird, which makes it very unique, is it's one of the most intensively studied endangered species in the world. So a population of these birds has been monitored at Archibald Biological Station since 1969. Um, and there's been fairly intensive field work. So every month, the entire population is census. So we have accurate information on individual lifespans for every individual in the population. Um, all the nests of every family group is found and closely monitored. Um, so we have annual and lifetime reproductive success. Um, we can actually measure fitness in the wild. Um, what's really relevant for me is that starting in 1999, every single individual in the population has been blood sampled, and so we have this archive of blood and DNA samples going back through time. All the territories are mapped, and we also have a whole suite of relevant ecological data, so habitat composition, climate variables, uh, food abun abundance, fire history, etc. And so what this means is that over these 45 plus years, um, we've accumulated blood samples in completely documented life history as well as the whole suite of standard morphological traits um, for more than 4,000 individuals on a pedigree. Um, here I'm showing you the, all of the ancestors for one particular individual. This is kind of fun because this particular individual is inbred, so you can find um, loops in the pedigree. Our full pedigree has about 10,000 individuals, and so it looks something like this. Um, and this makes this all of this unique data makes the system great for asking evolutionary genetic questions as long as we add genomics. And so that's exactly what I did as a graduate student at Cornell. I developed a whole suite of genomic resources for the species. So um, I identified a panel of genome-wide SNPs, 
sequence, then assemble the genome, sequence, assemble the transcriptome to help annotate the genome, and I'm currently building a detailed linkage map. Um, today I'm just going to focus on the SNP data. So I used gene typing by sequencing to do the SNP discovery and then designed custom Illumina iSelect B-chips. Um, and we genotyped uh, about 3,800 individuals on 12,000 SNPs scattered across the genome. So here I'm showing you the number of adult birds in our population through time and the number of nestlings. The total number of birds is shown in blue, or sorry, in gray, and then blue I'm showing you the number of birds that we've genotyped. And so as you can see, we've genotyped nearly every single individual in, the po in our population for the past um, 15 years. <coughs> so using these data, um, we can plot allele frequency trajectories in our population through time. So here I'm showing you allele frequencies measured in the breeders um, from 1990 to 2013. Um, I've highlighted the few SNPs that show large shifts in allele frequencies. So these colored SNPs change in allele frequency more than 5.17. Um, and so we do observe large shifts in allele frequencies over the short time period in our population. And so the question now is, what is uh, governing these allele frequency dynamics through time? How important is selection versus gene flow versus drift? Um, and so uh, standard kind of traditional population genetic studies would use a model of like the right pressure model to look at allele frequency changes through time. Um, however, in our population, we know that we violate many of the basic assumptions of the right fisher model. So we have overlapping generations, and we know that there are several related individuals in our population. And another thing to note is that every population has a true underlying pedigree. And if you know the pedigree and you can um, incorporate the pedigree in your models of evolution, you have a lot more power to distinguish between selection and drift. And so, um, what I'm going to do is do a lot of modeling using the population pedigree and talk about three different things, if it will show up. So first, um, using the pedigree, I'll look at how particular individuals contribute to genetic variation in the population through time. Um, then we'll look at the influence of immigrants into this population and then test for selection. So to look at individual genetic contributions, the way I do this is using this approach where we assign every individual in our pedigree some genotype, 1-1, one, one, and then for our individual of interest, um, our individual of interest is given the genotype 2-2. Two, two. Uh, I then simulate Mendelian transmission of alleles down the pedigree um, and do this a million times, and what this gives me is a distribution of how much this particular individual has contributed to future generations. And so from our long-term demographic data, we know that there's really high variance in lifetime reproductive success among individuals in our populations. So here's a histogram um, of about 600 breeding adults that have already died in our population and the total number of fledglings that they produce throughout their lifetime, you can see that there's pretty high variance. A lot of individuals don't produce any fledglings before they die, while some individuals produce more than 30. Because we have the pedigree, we have the ability to actually um, identify all the descendants of a particular individual in our, in our population through time. And so, for example, here's a female that was born in 1985 who produced five fledglings during her lifetime, none of her kids survived to reproduce, and so um, this is the total pedigree of all of her descendants in our population. Um, here's another female born in 1985 who uh, was a lot more fit, and you can see that her pedigree of descendants is dramatically different. And so using the approach that I walked you through earlier on the pedigree, we can um, estimate the genetic contributions of these individuals to our population through time. So for this first female, she's expected to contribute a little bit to the population in 1987 and 89, or 88, 89, um, and then her genetic contribution uh, drops to zero. And this other female, 
uh, in contrast, is expected con to contribute a lot more to the population, and her lineages um, stay in the population even until the present day. One thing to note is that this uh, particular approach only gives you an expectation for what an individual's genetic contribution to the population is, and so a lot of my future work will be identifying individual haplotypes and then tracing the transmission of these haplotypes down the pedigree in order to get a more accurate estimate of an individual's actual contribution. Another thing that's fun, though, is we can look at um, how an individual's expected contribution to future generations, say 2013, is correlated with you know, standard measures of lifetime reproductive success. So here I'm showing you the expected genetic contribution of a particular individual in 2013 on the y-axis and on the x-axis. I'm looking at three different measures of lifetime reproductive success. So total number of offspring produced, total number of grand offspring produced, or total number of great grand offspring produced. Um, and as a sanity check, it's good to know that our lifetime, our measures of lifetime reproductive success are strongly and significantly correlated with uh, an individual's genetic contribution. Um, okay, so this was looking at contributions of specific individuals now. We know that immigration into our population is really important. So this is uh, the paper that Michael mentioned in the introduction. So we know that a large proportion of the breeders into our population are actually immigrants. And so if we can, we can then classify um, our individuals as immigrants versus residents, do the same um, approach to estimate their genetic contribution and get a sense of how much of the genetic diversity in the population was contributed by immigrants through time. And so you do the simulations. Um, and here, since I'm starting my simulations in 1990, I'm assuming that all of those individuals present in 1990 are residents, and I'm looking at the expected contribution of recent immigrants. So immigrants coming into the population from 91 on. And you can see that, um, as expected, due to the high levels of immigration into our populations, these immigrants actually play a really important role in determining uh, levels of population genetic diversity. Uh, we can tweak the simulations a little bit and assign immigrants coming in different years a different allele <coughs> and look at the contributions of specific cohorts of immigrants. So here I'm showing you the stacked, uh, the cumulative contributions of immigrants that appear in the population in 91 versus 92 versus 93 and so on. And so since the immigrants um, into the population are contributing a lot, uh, we think that they may play a large role in governing allele frequency dynamics at specific SNPs in the genome. And so in order to look at how allele frequencies are changing through time, um, I do simulations called gene dropping, so this is really similar to the simulations I showed before, except that here we're using the actual genotypes um, of the founding individuals and any immigrants coming into the population. We then simulate Mendelian transmission um, of these alleles down the pedigree to generate kind of expected allele frequencies in the population year to year. And so we do see a number of SNPs where there are large allele frequency SNPs. So here's one example SNP where the allele frequency increased from about 0.43 to 0.65 from 1990 to 2013. Um, we know that the founder allele frequency is a lot lower <laughs> than the allele frequency in the subsequent immigrants. Um, and so if we then plot the uh, expected allele frequency trajectories from our gene dropping simulations. It looks something like this. So here in the black line I'm showing you the mean expected allele frequency from our simulations and the gray bars show the 95% confidence intervals. You can see this closely tracks um, what we actually observe and so what this means is that for this particular SNP, yes indeed the um, large shift in allele frequency is largely driven by these incoming immigrants. Um, and it also means that our simulations can appropriately account for both genetic drift in the population and gene flow. And so knowing that, now we want to do is compare observed allele frequency trajectories with what we expect 
to see and see if we actually detect any signatures of short-term selection at the genomic level. Um, and so to do this, um, we did the gene dropping simulations um, and basically compared observed allele frequencies in 2013 uh, to the expected distribution. So from the million gene dropping simulations, we get some distribution of expected allele frequencies in our population in 2013. Um, most SNPs, we observe, the observed allele frequency lies well within the population are well within the expected distribution, and so we're looking for signatures of selection um, by finding SNPs where the observed frequency lies well without outside this distribution. And we can generate an empirical p-value uh, by calculating the number of simulations where the expected frequency from the simulation is more different from the median um, than the observed frequency. So testing for kind of net selection from 1990 to 2013, most of our SNPs are unsurprisingly neutral. So the observed allele frequency dynamics shown by the color line closely matches what we predict from our simulations. Um, but we do find evidence uh, of a SNP under selection. So in this particular SNP, you can see that the allele frequency starts to deviate from what we expect it to do starting in 2008, which this is total speculation. Um, but in 2008, in the fall, there was a high mortality event in our population in which 40% of the population died within a span of two to three months. We highly suspect this was due to encephalitis, some sort of encephalitis disease, but um, we're still following up on that. So it's just interesting that this particular allele starts to deviate in 2008. Um, we also looked for significant allele frequency shifts among adjacent years. So looking from year to year, are there um, periods of selection through time? And we found, okay. So we found evidence of selection in two time periods. So from 2001 to 2002, there were um, seven SNPs or eight SNPs that showed allele frequency shifts in this time period that were greater than expected in one SNP from 2008 to 2009. Um, we're also trying to test for evidence of fluctuating selection by looking at the variance in allele frequencies through time. Um, and so far, we haven't really found anything, but that work is still ongoing. OK, so to briefly sum up this, sec uh, this section, um, I told you that Knowing the population pedigree gives you a lot of power to estimate individual genetic contributions to the population through time. And these genetic contributions are cor tightly correlated with standard measures of lifetime reproductive success. Um, I also showed that due to high levels of immigration, gene flow is actually an important driver of many <coughs> allele frequency trajectories. Uh, but even accounting for gene flow, we do in fact <coughs> see evidence of um, allele frequencies changing dramatically due to short-term selection. So one thing to note is that everything I've talked about before is looking at uh, net selection across generations. So I'm looking at changes from generation to generation. But one thing um, to keep in mind is that selection can actually act on different stages of the life cycle within a single generation. So here's um, a typical life history cycle for a sexually re reproducing deployed individual. Um, and selection can act on multiple stages. So for instance, there can be selection that influences uh, which zygotes actually survive to becoming adults or viability selection. Um, there's sexual selection, so genotypes may influence which individuals actually successfully become breeders in the population. Um, fecundity selection, so different individuals of different genotypes may produce different numbers of eggs or babies. Um, and finally, there could also be gametic selection or segregation distortion. And so Tim Prout in the 60s showed that um, estimates of selection that look at changes from generation to generation are inaccurate because they confound all of these different selection components. Um, and Freddie Christensen and Ove Frydenberg in 
the 70s, came up with this really elegant uh, analysis called selection component analysis, in which it's like a series of nested hierarchical tests um, that allow you to detect selection at, acting at specific life history stages. Um, so the initial selection component analysis framework was designed for random mother offspring pairs. Uh, but since in our population we uh, have nearly exhaustive sampling, so we know um, we know mom, we know dad, and we know all we have samples for all the kids. Uh, what we've done is we've adapted the selection component analysis proposed by Christensen and Friedberg to account for the additional power we have when we have exhaustive population samples. Uh, so I'll walk you through some of our results so far. So for gametic selection, um, the question here is, do heterozygote individuals transmit both of their alleles equally frequently to their offspring? So in this kind of example pedigree here, we want to know if this big A, little a individuals um, has an equal uh, probability of transmitting the little a or the big A allele to its offspring. And so the way we do this is um, we take, we count up all of the families in our population that have at least one heterozygote parent. We count up the number of kids of each genotype um, for each of these families. And then using a maximum likelihood approach, uh, we can actually estimate the probability that a given male or a given female transmits the big A allele. Um, and then we can do a likelihood ratio test to see whether or not this probability is significantly different from 0.5, which is the null hypothesis. So we ran this test for females and males separately, found no evidence of gametic selection in females, uh, but found three SNPs that were um, under strong selection. So at, for these SNPs, the male preferentially transmits one allele like 80% of the time, so it's fairly strong selection. It's interesting that we see evidence of gametic selection in males but not females. This could be uh, because sperm production is a lot cheaper than egg production, so there are stronger opportunities for selection there. Um, but there's still a lot of follow-up that we need to do. So for the other three components, viability selection, sexual selection, and fecundity selection, uh, we use the same approach, and so I'll just introduce all three of them together. So for these three selection components, we used a mixed model approach where um, we fit the phenotype of interest, so whether or not an individual survives, whether or not an individual is a breeder, um, or the number of eggs a particular individual produces. Uh, we fit a number of random effects, so the kinship matrix, um, which is important because we have a lot of related individuals in our population. We also fit natal year and natal nest as random effects. And then the beauty and the curse of having a lot of data is that we then have a whole suite of possible fixed effects to consider. <coughs> and so factors that may influence um, survival and reproduction in our population include uh, attributes of the individual, so its age, when it when did it hatch, how big it was when it was a nestling, whether or not it's an immigrant, um, properties of its natal environment, so the number of helpers at the nest, uh, the habitat composition of its territory, the ages of its parents, and then environmental factors such as density, rainfall, um, acorn abundance, etc. And so we uh, use, run a bunch of models and do a variable selection step where we identify fixed effects that are important predictors of our response variable of interest. And after controlling for any of these possible confounding effects, we then um, ask whether or not uh, the genotype at a particular SNP is significantly associated with our phenotype. This is ongoing work, but I thought I would show you some preliminary results we have for viability and sexual selection. So for viability selection, we tested for survival through um, a number of different life stages. Um, so we band and we bleed all of the nestlings when they're 11 days old. 
Individuals typically leave the nest around day 18, and by day 30, they can usually fly, and so they stop pretending to be pine cones by day 30. Um, day 90, they're nutritionally independent from their parents. Uh, at day 300, so about a year, they're physiologically capable of breeding, and then we see um, whether or not individuals survive to breed in our population. And so we found a number of fixed effects that are associated with survival at these different life stages that kind of make sense. So hatch date, density, drought, pair, uh, pair experience, these factors make sense given what we know about the biology of our organism. So accounting for these factors, we found one SNP that was significantly associated with survival from day 30 to day 300. Um, and this SNP is pretty strongly associated if you look at individuals. Um, so individuals with a big A, big A genotype at the SNP have a 75% chance of surviving, whereas individuals with the a GG genotype have less than a 50% chance of surviving. And so it's a pretty strong effect allele that we're picking up here. Uh, rep we repeated this analysis in males. We find a slightly different suite of fixed effects that are important for males. Um, and after controlling for these fixed effects, we found two SNPs that are strongly associated with survival in that same time period, so day 30 to day 300. So it's clear that there's a strong genetic component to survival in our population, um, and there's a lot of follow-ups that we need to do. Um, okay, so we also tested for sexual selection. So here we're trying, we're testing looking for factors associated with whether or not a given adult individual is a breeder or a non-breeder. Um, we did this analysis separately in males and females again. We found nothing in females. Um, and in males, we found two SNPs um, on chromosome 20 that are strongly associated with whether or not a given individual is a breeder, a given adult is a breeder. Um, so here I've broken it up by age classes um, in yellow is so this is um, the proportion of individuals with a given genotype we didn't have any cc individuals in our population uh, but you can see that individuals that are homozygous for the t allele at the SNP have a much higher probability of being a breeder at a given age um, okay so to briefly wrap up this particular section um, i told you that selection can act on different stages of the life cycle this is ongoing work, but so far we've found three SNPs that are strongly associated with gametic selection in males, one SNP, um, and two, one SNP in females, and two SNPs in males that are strongly associated with survival in our population, and two SNPs that are strongly associated with sexual selection in males. Um, and we're running the fecundity selection models now. And the ultimate goal of this particular project is to estimate effect sizes and selection coefficients for SNPs at every stage in the life cycle, which gives us a lot of power to test for evidence of um, antagonistic selection within a generation, which, is, um, which could be an important mechanism for maintaining levels of genetic variation in the population through time. Um, also, by comparing uh, selection coefficients in males versus females, we have an ability to look for sexually antagonistic variation in our population. Um, so to wrap up the overall talk today, I talked to you about um, two different projects we have going on, looking for uh, the genome basis of rapid evolution in a natural population. <coughs> So I told you a little bit about gene dropping, which is a really powerful way of modeling neutral processes in populations with known pedigrees. Um, I showed you that because of the high levels of immigration to our population, we find that gene flow is actually a really important driver of allele frequency trajectories in our population. But even accounting for gene flow, we do find evidence of strong short-term selection. Um, and finally, selection component analysis is this framework that it allows us to um, look for kind of a genotypes associated with selection acting at specific life history stages in our population. And the combination of these two approaches 
will give us a really um, complete understanding of how selection works in nature. And one thing to note is that a lot of these approaches are designed to detect single alleles of large effect, and so a lot of my future work will be um, trying to adapt these methods to be able to detect signatures of polygenic selection. Okay, so none of the work I talked about today would be possible without the many, many interns, students, and staff that have collected the demographic data at Archival Biological Station throughout the years. Um, the study was started by John Fitzpatrick and Glenn Wolfenden in the 60s, and now Reed Bowman is in charge, and Shane Pruitt and Angela Tringali have actually done a lot of the um, field work over the past few years. I'd like to thank um, members of the Coop Lab and my past mentors, and as well as a bunch of collaborators. Also wanted to give a shout out to Emily Josephs is giving botany lunch um, Friday at noon. So if you're interested in learning more about polygenic adaptation in uh, wild and domesticated plants, you should definitely go see her talk. Um, also, I am excited to say that I am starting my lab at the University of Rochester in July 2018. I'm looking for students, postdocs, and collaborators. So if you are interested in thinking about population genomics of pedigrees or conservation genomics, please contact me. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. But with the genome, can you figure out what any of the loci or blocks of loci might be in the lactose um, Yes, we haven't done that yet. So we're currently um, <coughs> trying, we're currently getting packed bio data to get a better genome assembly. And then we're going to annotate it and then look for LD so we have a sense of the haplotypes around our hits. <coughs> but we haven't done any of that yet. <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, I have two questions that I want So the first one, um, the way you're looking at gametic selection, is that also confounded with viability in early life of the uh -huh. new, new hatchlings? Or? Uh, that's a good question. So for gametic selection, I forgot to mention this, but I only included families where all of the eggs hatched and survived to day 11, and so we had complete uh, sampling, so that eliminates any yeah. early viability. But that's a good question. Um, would it be possible to use the data to look for um, evidence for epistasis? So basically, does the fitness of the SNP depend on the genetic background? Yeah. It might be a power issue. But yeah, I think okay. we'll have really little power. <laughs> I've thought about that, so um, it's possible to look for correlations among alleles through time, um, but I haven't explored any of those topics in detail yet. Yeah. Um, I had a question about the immigrants. Do you do you have any idea of how far away they're coming from? Are they other populations nearby in Florida or further away, or do you know anything about them? Um, so. These birds are really uh, wimpy flyers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we think that the immigrants aren't coming from too far away. Um, there are other populations near Archbold, um, and the folks down in Florida do offsite surveys once a year. Um, what I can tell you is that those populations are rapidly declining slash disappearing, and so that was what uh, the first paper that came out of this work was about. So we showed that because the regional area isn't maintained, the number of birds coming into our population through time has been uh, decreasing through time, which uh, is leading to increasing levels of inbreeding. But I don't know where <coughs> these birds are coming from necessarily. They're either coming from north or south, because um, <laughs> that's where the <laughs> scrub is. Um, but I don't know how many populations are coming from. I'm hoping to do more sampling in the peripheral areas in the future, and then we'll be able to answer those questions. Were the uh, well about the immigrants? Are there are they males, females, or both? Um, so the immigrants are predominantly female. Um, in the system, it's strongly female bias dispersal. But we see a few male immigrants, but they're mostly female. 
I presume this is not a, a sink population, so that you must have upward migration as well. I would think. Um, it's actually mostly a sink. Um, yes. There isn't that much evidence of outward migration. So um, they do the peripheral surveys once a year, and so if there are any of our banded birds leave, we general we know. Um, there are very few banded birds that leave. There's also been a population that was really closely monitored, um, a suburban site that's fairly close to Archbold. I don't know the exact distance. And that population was monitored from 1993 <coughs> to 2010 before it basically was uh, went extinct. Um, and during that time period, we saw several birds go, coming from the suburban mm -hmm. population to Archbold, and I think just one bird moving out. And so emigration is low. Yeah. Do you, have you compared lifetime reproductive success of the immigrants to, say, randomly chosen adults in the population? Um, I haven't done it um, very carefully. Um, it's tricky because the immigrants, we don't actually, we assume that they first breed when they show up in the population, yeah. but we don't know for sure. Um, we do know that children of immigrants tend to be less inbred, um, and there is evidence of inbreeding depression in the population, and so perhaps you would expect them to have higher fitness. But I, I guess I was just wondering, from the perspective of the population that you're mm -hmm. studying, it, are, are immigrants making a greater proportional contribution uh, than, than residents? Yeah, that's actually one of the things we're trying to work out <coughs> now. So we're trying to work out um, the math to see if we can predict um, what proportion of the allele frequency change through time is due to drift versus due to immigration. Haven't worked that out yet. Um, but from the work that I've done so far, we know that um, recent immigrants from, like, so recent immigrants coming into the population from 91 onwards make up about 75% of the uh, genetic variation in the population in 2013. So they do have a really big impact. Yeah. Do you have any sense of whether selection could be strong enough to also influence um, the expected trajectories under the gene dropping simulations? So with really strong selection, you might expect that um, even unlinked those have would be affected by that. By our gene dropping simulations? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, this is something that I've kind of beat my head against because it's a little weird thinking about using simulations on the pedigree as a neutral model because the pedigree itself encodes fitness, yeah. right? Because there's going to be variation in the, in the number of kids. We've thought about um, ways of breaking that link. And so basically, the test that we're doing right now is the most conservative test possible. Um, it's definitely true that there, there may be um, regions of the genome under selection that we're not picking up on. We're thinking about doing simulations where we can permute the number of kids among individuals, and so that keeps the variance in um, offspring number the same from year to year, but breaks up the association with genotype. But we haven't, I haven't done that yet, so I don't, I don't know what that will look like. Yeah, Given the uh, prevalence of nest helping, I'm just wondering if you're able to look or find any evidence for kin selection. Um, so there's been some previous work looking at this. I haven't actually touched it myself yet, um, but there's a lot of work that shows that having helpers um, helps nestling fitness and is strongly associated with nestling survival and um, survival to breed, but I haven't done any work with helpers myself. Yeah. I just if you'd care to speculate on what might be maintaining these rare SNPs of these rare alleles that seem to be under strong, you know, disadvantageous selection, like whether they might be coming in for, with the immigrants or preferentially or anything else? Um, I think gene flow definitely plays a large role, for sure. Um, but one thing that I'm curious to see once we're done with testing for fecundity selection, so I showed you that we had hits for gametic selection, viability selection, and sexual selection. None of these hits overlap. And so my guess is that if we see a SNP under strong state gametic selection, it might be disadvantageous later on in the life cycle, and that would be enough to maintain its frequency in the population. So, but that's something um, 
that we need the last piece and then we'll look at kind of effect sizes and selection coefficients on SNPs at every different life stage and then we can get um, the ultimate goal of SCA is to be able to completely predict allele frequency trajectories based on these selection coefficients. So I, I have to ask about this driving allele in males. So you uh -huh. said it had 80% drive, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's pretty it's dramatic. Really high. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there are a, a number of meiotic drive systems that have been well described in mice and other, other things, and they're often associated with recessive deleterious alleles. Hmm. Um, and so have mm -hmm. you looked to see if the homozygotes, uh, if the males that are homozygous at these SNPs uh, have lower reproductive success? I haven't looked at that, but I will now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that, so if this were in mice, that would be true? That would be true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, I haven't actually looked, but that's a good suggestion. Thank yeah. you. All right. Well, okay. oh. <laughs> so the 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 one the uh, particular um, SNP where you said there were no homozygous individuals with CC or whatever. Mm -hmm. How how do you explain that? How could it be possible that there would be none? Um, I think I don't know. Um, so for that particular SNP, I think the C allele is fairly rare in our population. Um, I don't know the allele frequency offhand, but. Most individuals are homozygous for the other allele. So I think C is just rare. All right. Any other questions? Going, going. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.